Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. As always, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon community. Visit patreon.com slash talking tutors for more information. Now is actually a great time to join because you'll receive a month free when you pledge annually. Join the Talking Tutors patron family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to enter patron-only monthly giveaways. July's prize is a Six Queens and a King trivia game, kindly sponsored by Horton Games. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Tony Riches back to the show to chat about Penelope Devereux, also known as Penelope Rich and Penelope Blunt. Tony Riches was born in Pembrokeshire, West Wales, United Kingdom, and spent part of his childhood in Kenya. He gained a BA degree in psychology and an MBA from Cardiff University. After careers in the Royal Air Force, the NHS and local government, he's a full-time author of historical fiction. His Tudor trilogy has become an international bestseller, and he is in regular demand as a guest speaker about the lives of the early Tudors. Tony has returned to Pembrokeshire, an area full of inspiration for his writing. Let's dive straight into our conversation. Welcome back to Talking Tudors, Tony. How are you? Good. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Yes, it's always lovely to speak to you. And so obviously people that have been following you online know that you write some wonderful Tudor novels and you set out to tell the story of the Tudors through your novels and your latest book. That's what we're here to chat about. So Penelope Tudor Baroness. So how does that fit into the the narrative? It was quite an interesting conundrum because I started off with Owen Tudor's first meeting with Queen Catherine of Valois. And then the idea was to go to the death of Elizabeth. But that left the whole series ending in a bit of a clunk. Because she did, um, she didn't have a very happy ending, did she really? And so I decided that rather than just write three books for the Elizabethan series, I'd do three of her favourite men and then three of her favourite ladies. And uh, the men were Drake, Essex and Raleigh chosen really for the very different facets of the Queen that they saw. And then I had quite a lot of fun because she had lots of ladies to choose from. And I kind of drew up a short list. Uh, And uh, I suddenly realised that I could get extra value from five years of research that I'd done if if the three ladies I chose were fairly closely associated with the three men. So they, they they all cross over in all sorts of interesting and intriguing ways. And um, it all fell into place like a jigsaw puzzle, really. So the order of the three ladies is very broadly in the most logical order of their lives, you see. So the the one that finished first came first, and the one that lived the longest comes last. And uh, I've really enjoyed it because a trilogy gives you such scope for developing characters and exploring events like, I don't know, the Spanish Armada or the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, things like that. But once you go past three books to six, it really is a very enormous landscape that you can 
play with and work with. And that's what I'm enjoying at the moment. I'm I'm really uh, immersed in the, the world of the Elizabethan court. It is a fascinating world. So before we, we dive in and talk a little bit more about the life of, of the protagonist, Penelope, of th- this last novel, do you want to tell us just who she was, just in case people aren't sure who we're talking about? Yes, it's what happened was that I, I kind of came across her in a book by Elizabeth Fremantle called, is it called Watch the Lady? Uh, it was a oh, long yes. time ago I read yes. it. But that's the first time I came across her. And I remember thinking, what a remarkable story. I wonder how much of that is historically accurate. And then, of course, when I was researching her brother, Robert Devereux, for my book Essex, uh, Tudor Rebel, uh, I realised that his his elder sister was quite pivotal in his life because his mother was a, a most curious lady <laughs> who rarely saw them, really, well, as children. She was always off enjoying herself. And... Um, Penelope was, as as the eldest, she was like the, the mother of the family and had to grow up very fast, as I did, because I was the eldest. I've got four sisters and a brother. So as the eldest, um, I, had to, I had a very short childhood and had to grow up very quickly. And so I, I, I could kind of relate to a lot of those things. But she is an absolutely remarkable Elizabethan lady. And as the brother of uh, the Queen's favourite young earl. She had all sorts of uh, connections and leverages, which obviously most of society t- couldn't dream of. Yeah, so she's the daughter of, of Lettuce Knowles, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And Walter Devereux, yeah. who sadly, I think he was poisoned in Ireland. There are still people that say he just died of a fever, but um, his servant died the same day. <laughs> yeah, that's and, curious, uh, isn't it? There was lots of poisoning going on. At the time, and it, it actually suited the Irish for him to just not be around anymore. So it would have been so easy to poison him because uh, he relied on them for his food and his drink. Absolutely. So so we know that uh, Penelope's mother, Lettice Knowles, of course, married uh, one of her husbands, was the, the Queen's favourite, Robert Dudley, and that Absolutely. didn't go down very well. And, and so how was Penelope affected by her mother's banishment when she was sent away from court? It's a really interesting thing because... I think it made her mother absolutely determined to get Penelope into court as her, not a spy, but as as a representation of the family, really. So right from a young age, uh, Penelope was groomed to become a maid of honour and never really had any other choice because that was her life was mapped out for her. Uh, It would have been really interesting to see what would happen if the Queen had refused, but uh, Elizabeth's a very complex woman, as as we know, and although she could bear a grudge, she had no particular reason to bear a grudge against Lettuce's daughter or or either of her daughters, although she did in the end. And um, I think she thought she, it'd be quite fun to give her a chance, and it, she would become Penelope's surrogate mother and do a better job of it than uh, Lettuce had done, and that would be a poke in the eye for Lettuce, her rival perhaps. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about what life was like for her while she was serving Queen Elizabeth? Well, the whole of the the role of maid of honour is is a bit of a strange one, because in theory, they were almost like nuns. They were maidens, chaste women, often dressed in white, so they didn't upstage the Queen with their with their colourful gowns or anything. And And the idea was that Elizabeth would surround herself with these virtuous and beautiful young women which and would reflect their virtue and beauty herself and it kind of worked in a in a, in a way but the reality of the thing as far as i can tell was the complete opposite because the maidens all lived communally and slept in a, the maidens chamber and as you know the elizabethan court traveled a lot so there was a lot of chopping and changing, and uh, sometimes they were all crammed into an attic room in somebody's house. And it became gossip central in that they had privileged access to every coming and going at court between them. There's always one of the maidens was present at every meeting, and they just loved to gossip. They had nothing else to do. They used to play cards and gamble. But uh, they were chased, but they were chased by the young men of court who would have a lot of sport um, seeing how many of the maids of honour they could actually um, get around, if you know what I mean. 
So it wasn't unknown for maids of honour to be disgraced and find themselves um, with child. And then, if luckily, they would escape banishment to the tower and um, disappear into obscurity. But Penelope, because she was so well prepared for it by her mother and others, that um, she was really thriving in that environment. And of course, she was fluent in three languages, very astute. She'd been educated better than most men. And uh, it meant that they always underestimated her. So they they would talk in in French in front of her and assume that her French was fairly weak, which if she could hear, understand the, every nuance of everything they were saying. So I, all of that I found fascinating. Yes, absolutely. And her father eventually chooses uh, Philip Sidney as her, her husband, and she becomes the inspiration for Stella in his sonnet sequence. So tell us a little bit about that and what happened. Well, Philip Sidney, what can we say? Like most poets, he, he was a dreamer and uh, he lived in a little fantasy world. He saw himself as the, the new King Arthur. And actually, um, it became like a self-fulfilling prophecy because he was very literate, but he was also a, a brilliant jouster and swordsman and could take on all comers at the Queen's Ascension Day jousts and things like that. But at the same time, he was a, a truly gifted um, writer and poet. And even to this day, uh, scholars are, are finding new things in, in his poetry, as, as I have. I've obviously gone back to it with fresh eyes and looked at it from Penelope's point of view. And he could have married her, but sadly for Philip, he was penniless. In fact, he was in debt. And um, his uncle was Robert Dudley, that we've already spoken of. And his kind of game plan was Robert Dudley wasn't going to last forever. And if he didn't have a, a legitimate son, then Philip would stand to inherit the title of the Earl of Leicester, as well as the the Dudley fortunes. And so um, he was onto a good thing, but he'd have to wait for it. So he in, get embarked on this long-term relationship with Penelope, but never asked her to actually marry him. Ah, I see. So they didn't get married. So then she she does marry, though, I believe, Baron Robert Rich, which I think you feel like maybe was a bit of an unlikely choice of husband. So why did they end up together? Well, uh, Robert Dudley's the one to blame in that his job as the stepfather was to find um, a good match for his stepdaughters, both of them. And a good match in his book was somebody uh, with more than enough money to keep Penelope in the style to which she was accustomed and to father her children and to generally bring her up in a good Protestant household. And Robert Rich was actually an extremely wealthy he was, a, he was a lawyer of sorts, but he was also a massive landlord and very harsh with his tenants. So raked in an awful lot of income from um, rents, more than really he could have done. And so he was the perfect choice from uh, Robert Dudley's point of view. And he was only a year older than her. So it wasn't like he was twice her age, which quite often happened. A year old, there's nothing in, in uh, Elizabethan times. And he could be very, very charming and personable in his business dealings. And that's what they treated it like. They did a deal over a glass of wine in in their studies, you know, and that poor Penelope didn't have any choice in it at all. I don't think she was even consulted. Well, that's difficult, isn't it? And so how does that marriage end up? Well, it's fascinating because if you think about what is most important to Puritans, and then what was most important to Penelope, she loved singing and dancing and partying and uh, generally having a good time. And all of those things were not even on the list for her husband. What he wanted her to do was to be locked away at Lee's Priory and bring up his family, basically. And that was really a long way from London over, over in opposite side of the country and really quite cloistered. In fact, it was obviously a, a priory uh, which had um, come to his family uh, through the Reformation. So she was almost like a nun bringing up children. And uh, it really saddened her to think that her, her best years were going to be wasted in obscurity. The relationship with him was at best one of compromise and 
this is the direction that it went in, in that she had enough of it, but uh, they did a deal basically between them because he didn't want the disgrace of his wife um, not really wanting to be around anymore. And uh, she wanted the money. So uh, between them, th there was a fairly obvious deal on the books. And, you know, I, I think um, he was terribly hurt by all of that in his Puritan way because he had a, quite a lot of self-belief. But from what I've read, actual accounts of him sitting in judgment over cases as a magistrate, and there's a harshness to him and uh, that Penelope would have found very alien, quite frankly. And so Penelope's brother, which I'm sure some people, our listeners, have heard of, embarked on a, on a slightly futile rebellion, I suppose you could call it, against Elizabeth I. So why did he do this? And why did he actually accuse Penelope of, of being part of that? I was going to say, you could write a book. I've wrote, <laughs> written a whole book about it. Although I don't say in the book, because it, there wasn't such a concept, really, in Elizabethan times. But the issue is one of emotional intelligence, which is really quite a complicated concept to get your head around. But it, it's really a, a kind of almost a mental health issue where partly through uh, development, perhaps in his rather curious childhood, he was not good at judging uh, the emotional side of situations, reading people. He wasn't good at making judgments <laughs> and Try as she might, uh, Penelope tried to keep him on the straight and narrow, but he was a loose cannon and uh, did whatever he wanted to do. And, of course, the worst thing is he surrounded himself by like-minded people. He drank a lot, gambled, womanised, and um, they encouraged him in all of that because it suited them. But So he might as well have not been married because uh, he lived like uh, what I think of as, as like... Um, the caricature of, of the rake who's always drinking and what have you. But Penelope uh, realised that she couldn't stop his, his thinking. And actually, they'd been discussing for a while uh, the succession because Elizabeth uh, was not a well woman and it was patently obvious to everybody that she wasn't really as able to deal with things as she, as she had in the past. And there's this massive question of if anything happened to her, for whatever reason, who would succeed her and what might that mean for the family? So it's said, uh, obviously, this I've seen um, reports of this, but I can never be certain of it. It's said that Robert Devereux carried around his neck a container with a letter of support from King James and uh, that Penelope, we do know, used to enjoy writing letters uh, to the, the King of Scotland just to sort of warm him up to the idea that there were people that would like to see him as king, as King of England and Scotland. So they'd been thinking about this for a long time. And so, of course, um, Robert Devereux ends up on the scaffold. He's executed. So what is Penelope's relationship like with Elizabeth, the Queen, after that? Almost non-existent, really, because how do you get back from somebody ordering your brother executed? But on the other hand, um, they knew that there could only be one outcome of what he did. He wasn't going to be let off with a warning because he'd gone too far. He'd actually um, attacked the Queen's uh, yeoman and um, generally caused a riot in the streets of London. He did try and claim that it was her advisers that he was... Um, unhappy with, not the Queen herself. And all she needed was better advisers. But of course, uh, they were still the Queen's advisers and they advised the Queen that um, there's, she should rid herself of this troublesome Earl. And that left Penelope really praying, really, for the end of the Queen and uh, a, a King that she could work with again on the throne of England. And she does, in fact, end up serving Queen Anne. She becomes a lady of the bedchamber. So how did that position come about? Well, that's that's fascinating because I think uh, at some point uh, she suddenly discovered that there was going to be a new queen. I think people had focused so much on the idea of, of, of a king that the, the queen was almost overlooked. But friends of Penelope's uh, actually rushed up and offered themselves as ladies-in-waiting 
but Penelope played a better game. She she waited and chose her moment and then became the confidant of the new queen and was able to uh, warn her who not to trust and tell her who she might rely on and all those sort of things. And of course, by then, she was older and wiser and had been around the block a bit, so was genuinely able to be a, a, a very valued companion to the new queen. And of course, if you can imagine, the queen was very astute as well and completely um, chalk and cheese to Elizabeth. And so she could see they could mutually benefit from this arrangement and it worked extremely well. And so, Tony, you've obviously spent time immersed in, in the sources and writing about the life of Penelope. So what do you think is her, her legacy? That's interesting. It's it's fascinating to look at what became of her children because, as we said at the beginning, a, a lot of people might uh, not even know who she was because uh, they they didn't get so much. I certainly didn't hear anything about her at school. I might have heard about the Essex Rebellion, but they wouldn't have had time to mention that he had any sisters at all. Penelope's children continued her legacy in quite an interesting way because what happened was they got involved in various ways on the royalist side in the, the civil wars. And in fact, yesterday was the anniversary of her son Henry uh, being arrested whilst in a state of undress by the by the parliamentarians. <laughs> that was yesterday. So that's quite, quite intriguing, funny coincidence. Basically, he was put on trial. And sadly for him, uh, he was executed after a vote of uh, 31 to 30. So there was one vote in it. It just gives you a little glimpse of what life might have been like for royalists in the Civil War. But Robert Rich, her other son, was actually um, a colonial administrator, and he was involved, not involved, he was a, a key player in the companies like the um, the Guinea and uh, New England, the colonial companies, which uh, really began to exploit the slave trade, carve out empires for themselves. So uh, the ripples in the pond that, that started off with Penelope's influence over her sons extended globally because Robert Rich, if, if you look into his story, he actually had a lot of influence in the development of, of these companies. And Mountjoy, who was a son by Mountjoy, um, Charles Blount, who called himself, he was Lord Mountjoy, so that he was called Mountjoy Pie, everybody. And basically, um, he was a... Uh, quite a leading member of the court of King James and obviously a, very much a, a royalist. He he was quite influential at court as well. So even after Penelope's days, uh, she still had people influencing history and, and continuing what she started. So, Tony, you obviously you set out to tell the story of the Tudors, but Penelope's story takes us, you know, across the threshold, if you like, into the, the next reign or dynasty. Yeah. So what are you planning to write next? Is that the end of this series and you're looking into something else no. now? I normally uh, research in the summer and then I start writing in the autumn and then I edit in the spring. And, and uh, that cycle has been going on for the last 12 years. But we've we've not had a great summer so far. so. I've actually started writing the, it would be the fifth book in the Elizabethan series, which is the second of the three ladies. So as I said at the beginning, I've written the three men and their view of Elizabeth, and uh, Penelope is the first of the three ladies, and I'm now working on the second of the three ladies, and at the same time uh, researching the third. So I'm only publishing one a year. I, I like that system. I can focus on one book at a time and not get too confused between them. It's good because it means that I, I know where I'm heading for the next couple of years. Who knows after that? But I certainly won't be um, writing more in an Elizabethan series because I think six books in that is, is a nice round number. Goodness, that's extraordinary. Well, we've got more books to look forward to, so that's fantastic. Now, before I let you go, Tony, um, just the Tudor takeaway, which I ask all my guests for, so something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. Do you have a takeaway for us? I think I've mentioned it previously, but it's definitely worth mentioning again because it's become my the thread which connects the whole of the Elizabethan series, and that's the 
Folgopedia every day at the Elizabethan court. I know if people just type type into a search engine, um, Folgopedia, then it's such a wealth day by day almost of all sorts of fascinating details. And um, I can just share one with you that I, I was reading yesterday for 1588. Uh, Elizabeth is not taking uh, the threat of the Armada seriously until a few omens occur in um, Greenwich Palace. One is a, a profusion of fleas gathering at the window of her presence chamber. <laughs> they, they interpret that as um, an omen. They're not quite sure exactly what it means. And Francis Walsingham says... Uh, there's always a profusion of fleas at all of your windows, so like, let's not make too much of it. But then, just when uh, they're starting to dismiss that, a school of porpoises swim up the Thames to Greenwich, and they count them, and there's 30 of them, and uh, they think that's definitely a foretelling of a uh, Spanish armada coming up the Thames, and they need to do something drastic to prevent that. But all of this is in the is reported in the in the daily court day by day, and I just think that that's all stuff we weren't taught at school, isn't it, about the Spanish Armada? But those little details are so they're quite funny actually, but they're so telling, aren't they, of of the time? Absolutely, I never heard the the story about the fleas, so that's that's wonderful. And I'll add a link to to that website for our listeners in the show notes. Tony, thank you so much for coming back onto the show. It's always so lovely to hear about your books and your work, and I wish you all the best of luck with this latest project. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you again. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.